So in this video, what I want to look at is um, other things, other kind of restoring forces that can produce oscillations. Um, and so uh, one obvious one is the spring. So if you've ever played around with the spring, you know that if I can take the spring, which starts, let's say I attach a mass to an M, and it starts at some position in the equilibrium state, you know, we'll, we'll call that the origin. And then I can stretch out the spring to a position now x max. And when I let go, there's going to be a spring force, which is going to pull this back to the equilibrium position, x equals 0. But it has a certain amount of forward motion. Um, it's got a velocity, which means it has a kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is going to keep that mass moving. Um, and it's going to keep moving in the negative x direction. And the spring is going to compress. And it should reach a position of minus x max. And then the spring force is going to push it back. And then from there, it's going to return to its equilibrium position. But now it has a forward velocity moving it that way, and so it's going to bob back and forth. So again, we're going to be in the same kind of position where we're going to have, um, you know, a starting point one, or really starting point two, uh, move to position three, move to position four, move to position five, which is the same thing as one and three. Um, so in this case, our spring force is minus the spring constant times the extension x. Since our point of reference is the origin x equals 0, we don't need to write the extension as delta x. We can just write it as x. <clears throat> so this is going to be another example of um, oscillations or, or um, simple harmonic motion sometimes it's called. In this case the amplitude um, is just x max. Okay. Now what I want to look at is an, another interesting case where what if we put another force in there? What if we hang this spring in the y direction and we allow gravity to act on it? So let's say we start with the spring um, in some position of um, y equals 0, and then we let it go, and it extends itself to a position delta L, <clears throat> and then we don't touch it anymore, because what we have now is the force of gravity mg, which is counteracting the spring force which is trying to pull it up. But now we apply another force. We stretch it down even further to a new position, which we're just going to call y. Um, OK. Um, so uh, let me readjust this and not call the starting position, the equilibrium position, y equals 0, um, let's call this the equilibrium position. We're going to call this y equals 0. <clears throat> so I had to extend the, the spring a length delta L to get to our origin of y equals 0. But now that much much easier to measure the extension um, y, uh, this length here, <clears throat> um, from its uh, new equilibrium position, which is basically delta L versus the length of the spring. OK. Um, yeah, so here is equilibrium. OK, so let's apply uh, Newton's uh, first law on the equilibrium point. So the sum of the forces is equal to uh, is equal to zero. If we're looking at equilibrium, then we have the spring force minus the weight is equal to zero. 
So the spring force is equal to um, the weight. Or um, I could write this down as K delta L is equal to the weight. So the length at which this spring will first stretch out to reach its equilibrium position, you can calculate as the weight divided by the spring constant. Okay, so now, um, now let's look at the other position, um, the position where we've stretched it out to a length L with respect, I mean, sorry, we stretch it out to a length Y from the uh, equilibrium position. And so the sum of the forces um, is going to be equal to um, basically um, some net force which is going to be the new spring force minus the weight. Okay. <clears throat> so um, this new spring force is a length delta L plus Y from the uh, length of the, just the spring minus the weight um, and is equal to my net force and so now if I put things in, um, K delta L plus KY minus MG is equal to my net force. And what we said from the equilibrium case was that um, K times delta L was equal to the weight. So therefore, this term and this term will cancel each other. And what we're left with is that the net force, the restoring force on this um, spring is just Ky. And so now what we have is <clears throat> um, oscillations around the new equilibrium position as if the spring was originally just a length of um, its original length plus delta y. So in the end, what we have is its equilibrium position starting at delta L. And then we are now going to have oscillations around um, this point right here. So it's going to move, move an amplitude Y, and then it's going to move another amplitude, which we call this Y max. And it's going to bounce up to a position minus y max around this new equilibrium position. So the problem turns out to be exactly the same as if we put the spring flat on a table. Um, because now what happens is it just oscillates around the new position of um, basically where delta L stretches it to. And it's just going to stretch a position of... Um, y max measured from the new position of uh, delta L. <clears throat> okay, um, the next example we can take a look at is the pendulum. So this is a device that also oscillates. So we have a, if we have a pendulum and it starts over here, it's going to swing. It's going to go through an equilibrium position and keep on swinging. And then it's going to reach a new height over here and then swing back. So the pendulum is now going to oscillate back and forth, back and forth, from the left and the right. Um, and so if we analyze this, we'll see what is the restoring force on the pendulum. So let's say I have the pendulum extended out here at some angle theta. The string has a length L to the pendulum. The mass, there's a, the, sorry, the bob of the pendulum has a mass M. And the pendulum now is going to move along an arc length S um, to the X position, which we'll call the origin of zero as the lowest point, that's equilibrium position. And it's been it's stretched out to an x position we'll call A. So we're only looking at the motion now in the x direction. If we were to draw out the force diagram, 
then what we would have is basically a tension um, in the string, and we would have um, the weight pulling down this way, which means there is a component of the weight, um, weight sine um, of theta. Uh, now, I know it's sine theta because this is the angle theta, which means this is the angle theta. If these two are, these two vectors are 90 degrees with each other, that means this angle right here is also um, theta. And if that's theta, then um, this triangle here, which is not drawn very well, Um, this makes the weight the hypotenuse, and so um, we should get, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. So let me re redo that. That means this angle here is theta. This angle is going to be um, 90 degrees minus theta. Okay, so um, which makes this angle right here theta. So um, a little bit complicated, but in the end, just trust me in the fact that um, this vector here, the component that is moving it um, is the weight times the sine of the angle. So if we look at the, um, <clears throat> the sum of the forces in this direction right here, we can call that x prime, then the force is minus the weight times the sine of theta. So that's the force in the x prime direction, and um, which I can write as minus mg sine theta. And now if I use something called the small angle approximation, for, for angles less than 20 degrees, the sine is approximately equal to in magnitude just theta if I measured in radians. So you can check this for yourself if you were to take, um, it, on your calculator, you would take 10 degrees, change it into radians, and then put that angle into the sine then the sine of 10 degrees should be equal to whatever theta is in terms of radians. But in that, if that's the case, we can go back to our original pendulum. And our original pendulum here um, says that the sine is this distance right here, which I'm going to approximate to be the arc length. So therefore, um, this sine uh, of uh, theta, which is approximately angle theta, I can write down now as the arc length divided by the radius. Because <clears throat> you remember the arc length formula, S, was the radius times the angle in radians. Okay, so finally now we have something for um, the sine value. So that means the restoring force here um, so this restoring force, Fx prime, is equal to minus mg times the sine, which is really the arc length over L, so minus mg sine divided by L. And so um, the nice thing now is that it's basically um, linear with the... Um, distance s that you extend the pendulum to.